Hi, year 11, let's have a look at your paper six. So this is your alternatives to practical. So, in question one, a student is asked to investigate how partly covering the top of a beaker of water affects the rate at which the water cools. The apparatus used is shown in figure 1.1. So you can see that you've got a beaker of water, the lid partially covers the top of the beaker, and then there's a thermometer placed into the water. Part one asks you to read and record the room temperature um, just by reading this thermometer. So this is just checking that you can use a thermometer. Um, so you should have got 21 degrees Celsius there. In B, the student pours 100 centimetres cubed of hot water into a beaker. She places lid A on the beaker, so we can see a diagram here. This leaves half of the top of the beaker uncovered as shown in figure 1.3. She records the temperature of the water in the beaker and immediately starts a stopwatch. She records the temperature, theta, which will be in degrees Celsius, every 30 seconds. Her readings are shown in table 1.1. She repeats the procedure using lid B. This only leaves a quarter of the top of the beaker uncovered, as shown. So many of you missed the instructions. You're not reading carefully enough again. So for one mark, you needed to complete the headings row in table 1.1. I've taught you this. I've shown you that every single time there will be one mark for listing the units missing in the table. Um, so time will be in seconds. Theta was a temperature value. It told you this in the question. So that's in degrees Celsius for both A and B. And then complete time in the column, well, we were told it is being measured every 30 seconds. So you just need to go up in 30s until you reach the end of the table. In part C for one mark, you are asked to describe a precaution that should be taken to ensure that the temperature readings are as accurate as possible. Lots of you were giving me um, ways to check the repeatability so you're talking about repeating your experiment three times and finding an average to check and see whether you get similar readings each time that isn't what this question is asking for an accurate value is one that's close to the true value okay um so we want to make sure that our number that we read and put into the table is really true for how the temperature would be at each time so we want to wait until the thermometer stops rising before starting the stopwatch, or we could avoid parallax error by reading the thermometer with our line of sight perpendicular to the thermometer. This is an easier way to get the mark. This you have to explain quite carefully. If you do try to go for the avoidance of parallax error, I would suggest you also draw yourself a diagram where you kind of show where the thermometer reading is up to and then draw a dotted line and then put your eyeball at that exact point, it will just help reinforce what you're saying because if your language isn't good there, they're not going to give you the mark. In part D, I, it says, write a conclusion to this experiment stating for which lid the rate of cooling is greater. Justify your answer with reference to the results. When we practiced heating and cooling practicals, I told you that this always gets asked and the way the marks come uh, in this question are the same every single year. One mark for correctly identifying which one is bigger. Beaker A has a greater rate of cooling. That's worth one. Reference to the results, you have to talk about both values, your time and your temperature change. So we want to say in 180 seconds, beaker A's temperature decreases by 12 degrees Celsius, whereas beaker B's only decreases by 7.5 degrees Celsius. Now, it's not enough to just write these two. You have to refer to the fact that it's over the same time period because rate of cooling is how quickly it happens. It's not just what was the cooling, it was to do with how quickly it happened as well, so I need both. In II, suggest a change to the apparatus that produces a greater difference between the rates of cooling for lid A and lid B. Lots of you were coming up with ways that would change the difference, it would change the rate of cooling, but it doesn't change the difference between the two because it would work for both A and B. So we need to make sure that we want a bigger difference between the energy loss between the two beakers. 
Now we know that there will be a lot of energy loss to the surroundings through the sides of the beaker um, and that'll be the same for both and so that will be quite significant. If we insulate the sides of the beaker, it ensures that the thermal energy is only escaping from the surface, which will make the surface area more important and it will cause a greater difference. So that was your best choice there. In E, another student thinks that the cooling rate is directly proportional to the percentage of the surface area uncovered. He draws a graph of cooling rate against the percentage of uncovered area. Describe how his graph line shows whether these two things are directly proportional. So the only thing you're being asked here is how do you know whether a graph shows whether two variables are directly proportional? So one mark for stating that the graph will be a straight line and one mark saying that it must go through the origin to show a directly proportional relationship. Students in other countries in F are doing the same experiment. State one factor, they must keep the same to obtain similar readings. You do not need to list these all, but they're all options you could have. We want to keep the volume of water the same, the start temperature of the water the same, the same material for the lids needs to be used, the room temperature being used, the type of beaker, all possibilities there for one mark. In question two, a student is investigating a resistance wire. She uses the circuit shown. So you can see a power supply with a switch to control the circuit, an ammeter to measure the current flow, ignore the X for now, P and Q are labelled as terminals. Um, a resistance wire has been connected in and we can move the position of this crocodile clip to change how much of the wire is inside of the circuit. On figure 2.1, draw a voltmeter connected to measure the potential difference across terminals P and Q. So we want to know what the potential, the voltage value is at P. We want to know what it is at Q and we want to know the difference. And so we connect in parallel. And so we are going to put our voltmeter here and connect across. If you drew yours so your voltmeter was down here and then you had wires going round like this, that would also be okay, um, but this is your simplest uh, way of doing it. The student connects the crocodile clip to a length uh, nine centimeters of, uh, 90 centimetres of the resistance wire and measures the potential difference across the terminals P and Q and the current I in the circuit. And the values are shown on the diagram below. So, an ammeter current flow is measuring how many charges pass a point per second. Ammeters are in series. Voltmeters are in parallel because they are measuring a before and an after. What voltage value do I have here? What do I have here? What is the difference in potential across these two points? Now, a surprising number of people did not read these scales correctly. This, I think, is not because you can't read a scale, but because, because you're probably rushing. Okay, halfway between 2 and 3 is going to be 2.5. You can see that there are five small scales between the marked point and 3, so each small uh, increment is worth 0 0.1. This is 2.6 volts. Some of you were writing values that were larger than 0 0.4. That doesn't make sense. The dial is to the left. Again, 0 0.3 will be halfway between the 0 0.2 and the 0 0.4. There are five increments in between 0 0.3 and 0 0.4. So each small increment is worth 0 0.02. I've got from here, from my 0 0.3, I've got one, two, three. So I've got three lots of 0 0.02. I get 0 0.36 amps on this one. This one was particularly badly done. So that gets put into uh, my table. So I put my values in. Again, we're not reading carefully. The student then connects the cro crocodile clip to lengths 60 centimetres and 40 centimetres of the resistance wire. She measures the potential difference V across terminals P and Q and the current I in the circuit. Readings are as shown. Complete the column headings for a mark. By writing V for volts and A for amps for the voltage and current, you got a mark. If you lost that mark, 
you are giving them away. That's a gift of a question, it's very easy. In part CI, it says calculate and record in table 2.1 the resistance R of each length L of the wire. Use the readings from the table and the equation R is V divided by I. So we take V, 2.6, divided by I, 0.36. I get 7.2. All my values I used are two significant figures. And so I should only be quoting to two significant figures, really. Okay, if you gave to one more, if you wrote another decimal place, that's fine. But so long as you're the same for each number in the table. So you should have had 7.2, 5.1 and 3.1. If you have read this wrong, but you still calculated correctly, you will still get the marks here. Calculate and record the value of R divided by the L value um, and pop that in as well. Again, I've gone for two significant figures. As long as you're consistent, you can have plus one here as well. Uh, so these are the numbers that you should have had. Another student suggests that the values of R over L for each length of wire should be the same. So it's saying how much resistance in ohms do I have per centimetre of wire? And I'm checking it when I've used different amounts of length. Well, I say that the results do support the suggestion. Now look, they are not identical numbers mathematically. However, the biggest difference is between these two. And the difference is 0 0.007 ohms per centimetre. That is tiny. It is insignificant. So I say the results do suggest this. These numbers are basically the same. Okay. Mathematically, no. In a maths lesson, no. But in a physics lesson, yes. These numbers are close enough together that we can say that on average, the resistance per centimetre um, is the same. And we can say that can be explained by the errors that we made in the experiment or the uncertainties that we have in the experiment. Okay, so you want to reference values. So you can see I need numbers in my answer to get the mark. In part E, suggest one difficulty which explains why different students doing the experiment carefully with the same equipment may not obtain identical results. Well, you saw this practical in the classroom. We had a wire on a meter ruler and the crocodile clip was just getting connected onto it. The crocodile clip itself is about 0.5 centimeters wide. And so being very specific about measuring to the nearest millimeter is very unlikely to be accurate. It's very difficult to judge the position of the crocodile clip and measure it to the nearest millimeter. And we might be off slightly, which is going to change our numbers. Um, so they won't be identical. F. A student finds that during the experiment the wire becomes hot because there is a high current. He decides to use a variable resistor to, pre uh, to prevent this. Draw an X on the circuit in figure 2.1 to show where a variable resistor is connected for this purpose. So, as it stands we have a power supply and the voltage before the variable resistor is, draw uh, is put in is dropped all the way across this wire. So energy is being transferred by the charges across this resistance wire. If we want less voltage to be dropped across the resistance wire and we want the overall current to be reduced, we need the overall resistance to be greater. We need to add more resistance into the circuit it needs to be connected in series. So here would be a perfect place. You could also have chosen to pop it here, or here, or here, that's absolutely fine, but it needed to be that it was in series with the wire. And then a shocking number of people got this wrong. This was an easy question. In the space below, sketch the circuit symbol for a variable resistor. You, you knew that you had to memorize these. A resistor, I should actually add my wires as well, to be fair, but you'd still get the marks how I left it. A resistor is just a rectangle, and then to make it variable, you add an arrow through it. In question three, a student investigates the magnification produced by a converging lens. He uses the apparatus shown. So we have a hole cut out of a piece of card in the shape of a triangle. So light is coming through the triangle from this light bulb. It could have been a candle. We use lenses, it's the same kind of thing. 
Some distance away, we then had a lens, and then some further distance away, we had a screen. We used these in the classroom. You've seen these. The illuminated object consists of a triangular-shaped hole, so we're seeing this bit here, we're seeing the profile of, so we can see what it looks like from the front view. It says, measure and record the height, h naught of the triangular-shaped hole. You literally just needed to get a ruler and measure that length. Now, for some very odd reason, when the photocopying happened, some were slightly different. So some of you may have had 1.4, some of you may have had 1.3. I checked yours all individually, so whatever you have, you should have just measured correctly. A shocking number, you didn't. So I have 1.3 centimetres for mine. In B, it then gives you the image. Okay, so if we go back to the original diagram, this bit was measuring the height of the triangular object. And then on the next page, the image is formed on the screen. We practice doing this. We're measuring the height of the image. Again, you get your ruler and you measure that height. Mine was 4.2 centimeters. I checked yours as well. So the student repeats this for different U values. So they change the distance between the uh, hole that the light is coming through and the lens. And then they measure the distance in centimetres and then they measure the height of the image, the size of the image produced. And we've got that data in a table. So it says, measure and record in the first row the height I of this image. And I got 4.2, so in it goes to the table. Using your results from A and the equation M is HO over HI, calculate a value for M. Well, HO is what I found on the previous page, and I had 1.3, it will depend what yours is. I'm then dividing it by the value I've got here, which was 4.2, and I get 0.31. You should notice that all the numbers in this column are to two significant figures, so that is the significant figure value I quote to. There was range allowed here, but I'll be checking yours individually. In part C, you were asked to plot a graph. Now, you knew this was going to come up in this mock because you will always have this question in your paper six. Four marks for your graph. One mark comes from labelling your axes. This is a gift of a question because it always tells you at the top what to plot on which axis and it tells you the labels. So you take this label and you put it on the y-axis. You take this label, you put it on the x-axis. Your scales need to be chosen so that your points cover over half the grid in both directions. If your points are squished up down here or squished up here, you have not chosen good scales. So you can see mine are your, your best options. There are a couple of others that were possible, but this is what I would go for if you're correcting your paper because you didn't get it. One mark for your points being plotted correctly, and then one mark for a clear, thin line of best fit. Determine the gradient of the graph was done shockingly badly overall as a group. Really, truly, I've taught you this many, many times. You know from maths what the gradient of a graph is. It's the same process every single time. It also states, show clearly on the graph. You cannot just do a calculation down here. You have to have drawn something on your graph paper to get the marks. I've taught you this. I've told you to draw your triangle. You pick two easy points to measure that are as, as far as, apart as possible. You then read those values off so that you can get a change in Y and a change in X. Mine turned out to be 55 and 25. That difference is 30. My change in Y, my rise, is my 30. My change in X went from 0.6 to 2.6. That was 2 for my change in X, or my run, as you might like to call it. My change in y over my change in x is my gradient value. I get 15. The range you are allowed, based off the data points you should have used, were between 15 and 17. And if you were out of range, you wouldn't have got that second mark. In E, describe one difficulty that might be experienced when measuring the height of the image HI. So remember, when we got the lenses out and we got the candles and we were trying to... Um, focus an image when we did it we were holding the lens by hand and so some of you wrote down oh well it's really wobbly and it's hard to keep it still but you can't use that in this one because if you look it's very clearly 
or mounted and resting on a table. And so that isn't going to be an issue. You've got to apply it to the question that you've got. Suggest an improvement to the apparatus. Well, when we measure the image, which is light, if we then put our hand in front of it, it skews the image. Your hand or your ruler easily gets in the way of the illuminated image. The improvement there then is to fix a ruler to the screen already so that your hand isn't getting in the way. Or grab a pen and mark the top and the bottom of the image onto the screen and then you can measure that distance afterwards. Last but not least, not badly done on the whole, but still things that definitely need fixing collectively. A student is investigating the factors that affect the size of the crater the hole that a ball makes when it is dropped into sand. Plan an experiment to investigate one factor, that's a big clue that you decide, that affects the size of the crater. The apparatus available includes metal balls of different sizes and a tray of dry sand. Write a plan. We know the plan is worth seven. We know that the mark scheme follows the same pattern every single year. I've told you the things that you need to include. You tell me which factor is being investigated. They even specifically say that to you. You can't just say the size of the ball. You need to be specific. State a key variable to keep constant. List anything else you might need to use to make your measurements. Explain what is being measured and how it is being measured. How do we obtain reliable results? How might we draw a graph? The graph is here because I ran out of space, but let's go to this side. For mark point one, when it wants to get itself in focus, you needed to clearly state what you were deciding to change. You might have had metal balls with different diameter. You might have dropped the ball and kept the ball the same, but you might have dropped the ball from, the sa uh, from different heights. You might have kept the height the same and the diameter the same, but you might have changed the mass of the ball. You cannot just say, change the size of the ball. No one can follow that and know exactly what you mean. That's too vague. You need to specify very clearly which one you're changing. Mark point two then comes from stating a control variable. Whichever you don't change in this list has to be kept the same so that it doesn't affect your results. So let's say I'm going to change the diameter of my ball each time and look at how that affects it. If I change the diameter of the ball, I need to keep the release height of the ball constant and I need to keep the mass of the ball constant. Okay, so basically you pick one of these for your IV and then the remaining two become your control variables. For mark point three, you needed to list the other equipment that you needed. Different people will get different marks for this for different answers because it, if they've changed their independent variable, you will need different equipment. If you're just changing the diameter of the ball and then you're measuring the diameter of the crater, the only thing you need is a meter ruler and that will be enough to get you mark point three. But if you've changed the mass of the ball, you will still need a meter ruler to measure the crater, but you will also need a balance and so you actually need additional uh, apparatus. It depends on what you've stated, whether you get this or not, but mark point three comes from listing the other pieces of equipment that you need. For mark point four, you actually needed three distinct bits of information. You needed to clearly state how to measure your independent variable. It's not enough to just say, take your first diameter ball. Okay, well, I need to know what that diameter is. How would I know that? I need to measure it first with a meter reader. So lots of you were just assuming they were known values. This is never something that happens in real life. We have to measure our independent variable. So, e.g., find the mass of your first ball on the balance. Find the diameter of the first ball. Measure with a meter ruler the first height that you will drop the ball from. So that was the first part needed. Secondly, once you've made that measurement, you need to say drop the ball into the crater, uh, into the sand, sorry. And then the third thing is measure the diameter of the crater produced in the sand or the depth. Or you could say both, that's fine as well. Um, but you needed to be specific. If you said measure the size of the crater, you're not getting the mark. Size is not specific in physics. There are many ways to measure the size of something. You need to tell me which thing you're going to measure. Mark point five, 
comes from saying, okay, repeat all of this, but for my other independent variable values. So it might say something like, repeat these steps for the balls that have different masses or balls of different diameter. But it's repeating the procedure for your other um, independent variable values. For mark point six, it was like a bonus mark for some additional details. So you could have said, and I've told you this, it's the same every year, you could, for each value of independent variable, take three repeats, which lots of you wrote, but then you didn't get the mark because you forgot to say that you then find an average from those repeats. That was one way you could get mark point six. If you gave me very specific detail about how to measure the crater accurately, um, so place a piece of string over the top um, and then take that string over to a ruler, that might have got you mark point six. Smooth or flatten the sand between each test would have got you your uh, mark point six. Showing me that you're testing at least five different values of independent variable, mark point six. Um, ensuring that you drop the ball with no force so that it's released the same way each time, also. Mark point seven, lots of you have got into good habits now of drawing your axes out. The problem was you were too vague and you wrote size of ball, size of crater, too vague. I need a very specific thing that I can quantify with the unit. If you don't have your units, you're not getting the marks. Okay, so these were your options for your X and Y for mark point seven.